Hello and welcome used Bacazers to this mashup where we, if, you, if it's your first time watching one of these, what we do is we take two or more books and we compare them and we can contrast them and see if it's negotiation, we'll look at two different books and talk about negotiation and how they approach it and is there commonalities, is there completely opposing arguments in the books. And then we look at something like persuasion or sales or leadership, whatever it is. The two books that we're going to talk about today are to do with sense making, it's about understanding now, it's, I should say sense making is kind of a new enough word in probably the last few years where it's about we're all bombarded with data all the time. There's never a shortage of information, right? If you work in sales or marketing or whatever, you can you can generate reports till the cows come home about all sorts of things. But the raw data by itself isn't that useful unless you can actually garner in, in, insights from it. And, and, and that's what he talks about in, in both of these books, really. Um, I should say they, not him, two different se separate authors. The first book is called Sense Making by Christian Madsberg, and the second book is called A Field Guide to Lies and Statistics by Daniel Levitin. Now, Daniel Levitin is a neuroscientist, and he talks about how you go about uh, deciding what's true and what isn't true. Whereas in Sense Making, uh, Christian Madsberg, and by the way, this book was by, f when we did a podcast on this, it was by far the number one downloaded uh, episode, so far anyway. Um, and I think that's really interesting. This is kind of an aside here, but I think it's really interesting that people were more interested in how to make sense of big data. It's, it's like a it's like a problem that's bubbling up for everyone that we're all just bombarded with data, like in our professional lives, where there's no end of the data. Like I said, reports upon reports. But what we're missing is insights. So in this book, what Christian Madsberg puts forward is that data by itself isn't enough. He says that you risk letting go of human intuition uh, at your peril and in this book um, Daniel Levitin's book he talks about how to decide what's true and what isn't he talks about things like, uh, like it breaks into three different parts basically the first part is how to interpret numbers right if somebody is firing statistics at you how do you know they're actually real or, or like one of the things he says and I actually have it underlined in this book is that uh, statistics are not facts when you think about that, it's, it's God, it's mad. It's, it's a crazy way to think about it, but actually it's true. Statistics are not facts. And the reason they're not facts is because these statistics, they're, first of all, they're gathered by people, by humans, who are, you know, finishing off these, gathering these statistics just before lunch or before they go home on a Friday. They're human beings. And then they're interpreted by human beings as well and then presented in a way that is favorable uh, to the people who are presenting it. Um, so statistics are not facts. So in this book, he talks about how to interpret numbers, then how to interpret words, and then how to interpret the world. And I'm going to talk about how the two books, um, they're absolutely not opposed to each other at all. They're actually a great complement to each other. Uh, it's a great way to understand, you know, do I agree what, with what Christian Madsberg says that uh, human intuition matters? And then, okay, if human intuition does matter, I need to use it to make sure that I'm actually making sense of the statistics and the data that's kind of coming at me. Um, the first thing, though, is that in uh, sense making, he talks about four different types of knowledge. Um, he does it a few times in the book where he talks about different, different, kind of gives different lists, you know, different principles to follow and so on. Very, very useful for, for somebody with my kind of mind, like a, a mathematical mind, I suppose, like lists and bullet points. But the four types of uh, knowledge he talks about is, first of all, uh, objective knowledge, right? So things that we just know to be true. So uh, gravity is a thing, right? Um, we can measure atoms, we can measure asteroids, right? They're objectively true, they, they can be objectively measured. The second thing he talks about then is um, subjective knowledge. And subjective knowledge is things that are true to me, to the inner self. These are the things that psychologists study that, uh, you know, you can have general rules about you know a, a population but in in the case of an individual it's you know it's gonna it's it's constantly in flux basically like i am hungry i am scared i'm feeling anxious right that kind of thing uh, next one then is uh, shared knowledge so shared knowledge is things like um you know what it's this is an example he gives is what what does it feel like to be a woman working in the usa right that's that's a shared knowledge between women that it's um it's understood or another example it gives is that um the jewish experience right people who are jewish know what the jewish experience is and people who are not jewish then can 
be on the outside of that culture and look in and, and understand that there is a shared knowledge there that Jewish people know what it's like to be Jewish or Irish people know what it's like to be Irish, whichever way you want to look at it. So there is, it's just a type of knowledge, just shared knowledge. But the last one then is like, um, I can't remember exactly what he calls it, like intuition or um, what is it he calls it? Uh, sorry, yeah, sensory. Sensory knowledge is what he calls it. And sensory knowledge is, he tells, he tells a story about uh, George Soros, right, who was considered to be the man who brought down the Bank of England. And he says that, uh, he, he's like a, an investor, right? And, and the way he did it, he, he bet against the English pound and, and nearly, nearly destroyed. Uh, we did bring out the Bank of England, but the whole point is that um, he tells the story about George Soros, and he says that George Soros takes in all this information, you know, uh, from all his analysts and so on. But he also looks at the things that are almost intangible, the things that shouldn't really matter, but they seem to do matter, right? So, for example, if one of his senior analysts happens to have a pain in his back. He'll take that into consideration when it comes to where he's going to lay his money down and where he's going to make his bet, basically. It's sensory knowledge that you can't, it's like that sixth sense that you, 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 can't, um, you can't explain it. Like if you go into a, into a pub and you just know the atmosphere is kind of dull or you, you just, if somebody says, what is it that you don't like about this pub? I don't know, just, just don't like it. Or if you're at a party and you know it's just getting started, right? There's nothing, nobody has, has specifically said anything but it's that sensory knowledge that this party is it's going to kick off or it's going to get good so george soros he knows that these this sixth sense thing exists and he uses it uh, he'll he doesn't rely on it completely it's not like he's just reading tea leaves and deciding where to put his money but he is very much um allowing for it and that's i guess what uh christian mansberg is talking about when it comes to um making sense of data that if you rely only on data you're, you could end up in trouble right um he talks about he talks about five different um i actually have it written on posted here let me find it here it is uh, five different principles of of understanding or making sense of data and the first one he says is that you should look at the culture not the individual and he tells a story about another one of our authors from another one of our podcasts uh, chris voss who wrote uh, never split the difference and um, I'll just tell a story again real quick. Um, Chris Voss basically was an FBI hostage negotiator and found himself doing his job one day where he's trying to negotiate hostages out of a, out of a, a tricky situation. And rather than looking at the, uh, the demands of the people who were the, the hostage takers, he looked at their culture and, and um, not just the raw information, but you know, the, the culture. So it was in, uh, the Middle East somewhere, I can't remember exactly which country it was, but he, there was a woman who'd been taken captive and uh, they hadn't covered her hair, right? And he made the point then, rather than talk about their demands on the, on the local news stations on, on Al Jazeera, he talked about uh, the disrespect that they, they had shown by not covering the woman's hair. And that completely had the, the, the hostage takers on the back foot then because like that, that kind of thing would matter in their culture. So he was understanding the culture rather than the individual. Um, rather than looking at the information, the, 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 the raw data, like what's in behind that information is, is, it was his point. And it's actually what he says, it's the example he gives in, in sense making that when you're interpreting data about your customers or about um, sales or marketing performance, you know, campaigns that are going well or not going well, you have to look at the culture behind these things that something in particular happened to make there be a spike or make there be a dip in um, open rates, click to rates, whatever the thing is that you're measuring. So there's more to it than just, um, there's more to it than just looking at the raw data, basically. Second one then, he says, is uh, thick data and not thin data, which is I've kind of um, overlapped there with, with, with that point. It's to do with intention. So um, raw data or um, thin data would be things like uh, what happened, right? 17% of the people opened the email, right? 8% clicked on one of the links. That's thin data, according to Christian Madsburg. And the thick data that you're looking for is the mood, right? Uh, the, the, the reason why it happened. Why then? Um, which is easier said than done, right? So the whole point is that, and I guess that's when you would pick up the phone or have, um, have conversations with people who are potentially your customers. He says to look at the savannah and not the zoo. So if you want to see, uh, you can go to the zoo and look at lions and tigers and elephants and so on. And they're interesting to look at. But if you really want to see what they're about, you'd go out into the, into the savannah. 
and see it in its real world. And he talks about um, uh, the, the car, the Ford Lincoln. And um, it's a, if you don't know, I, I didn't know this, but it's a, it's a luxury car, considered a luxury car in the US. And uh, they had, their market share was sliding, right, quite a lot. And they were looking at why this was actually happening. And what they decided to do was to go out and actually talk to the customers, talk to the people who would be their customers and ask them what mattered to them. And what they found out, and it's probably not a surprise to you, but what they found out was that the, the Ford company themselves were relying on, you know, excellence in engineering and, you know, zero to 60 and whatever amount of speed it did it in. But when they actually went and spoke to the customers um, in the real world, not just in the zoo and in the, in the factory where they're making the cars, they went out into the savannah where the actual customers were living their lives in these cars. And it was about all sorts of things. It was about making sure that they could continue their day's work if they were in a Lincoln, that they could completely um, close off the outside world and rock out to their favorite music. There was all these different things they hadn't really considered, but they, they wanted to be able to do those things in luxury. So you look at these things in the Savannah and not the, uh, and not the zoo. Um, the next one then is uh, creativity. Um, you should, you should, it shouldn't be, like when you're trying to come up with um, problem solving, problem solving to do it like data and analyzing the data, you should be more creative about it basically rather than just trying to shut things down and get into a final answer. Be creative about what you're actually doing. And the last one then he says is, um, is to look at the North Star um, or to, to, to consider the North Star, not, not just GPS. And he tells a story of um, the, the US Navy who used to be taught um, how to map the stars basically so they could they could travel just by looking at the stars and then when GPS came along they said oh, we don't need to train them in the um, looking at the stars anymore and then you know I don't know if they got hacked or something but um, they had to go back to teaching people you know the, the, the fuller picture rather than just um, relying on data and we're all capable of that we're all capable of you know switching on the, the Google Maps and um, you know just blindly driving wherever Google Maps tells you to go and you lose all sense of, um, of direction, which is, you know, you're, you're losing out on the human instinct then. It's a great joke by, um, I think it's Bill Burr, about, you know, nobody knows how anything works. Like the, the TV remote, like, you know, how does it work? You know, well, I pointed at the telly and pressed the buttons. You go, no, that's what you do with it. How does it work? How does it actually change the stations? And he, he makes a joke, and I'll completely butcher, but he says something like, if I was to drop you in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, and uh, with no supplies, um, no nothing, just the clothes on your back, how long would it be before you could send me an email to come and get you? Like, I mean, how long would it be centuries before you'd be able to, to, to do that? So nobody knows how anything works, even though we're all bombarded with this data all the time. Um, another thing he talks about, just to go back to the, to the, uh, the thick data thing, he talks about uh, having texture, and I, and I think that's kind of key, that when it comes to like the, the Ford Lincoln, he talks about how the, the CEO of, of, uh, of Ford is, you know, whatever, hundreds of thousands of people reporting into him or, you know, reporting up the chain to him, that he has a team of people whose job it is to protect his time. Uh, so when people come to, uh, come to him with, you know, for meetings and stuff, they've got 30 minutes to get their point across. And what they're going to get their point across in is completely sanitized and completely, um, you know, being practiced and rehearsed and rehearsed. And they've thought of everything you can possibly ask. And we have all the answers. There's no creativity in the conversation. There's no back and forth. And that's, um, he says that these, these executives and these CEOs are starving for, um, for, for insights or for, for real conversation, I suppose, about how, uh, how to interpret this data. Um, what else? Oh, so this, anyway, I've talked, that's, anyway, I've talked a good bit there about sense making. This book then, he goes on to um, talk in this book about how to interpret data. Um, so this, the, this book, Sense Making, is how to interpret the data, I should say. This one is, it's almost like a, a laser focus then on when somebody presents you with a statistic, how do you know that's actually true or not? Uh, one of the things, I, we just did a podcast on that book on um, a field guide to uh, lies and statistics. Um, and I opened that podcast by talking about the Monty Hall problem. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Monty Hall problem. I'll just, I won't give you the answer. I'll let you, let you figure this out with the, or listen to the podcast. But the Monty Hall problem goes like this. You are on a game show 
and you've gotten to the final round and there's three doors and behind one of the doors is a you know the prize a shiny brand new sports car and behind the other two doors is um what well <laughs> they generally say goats right as if they're booby prizes or bad prizes but you know as far as i know goats are quite expensive and you know go who doesn't eat goats cheese um anyway they're considered to be the prizes that you don't want right so what the scenario is this that you pick one of the three doors let's say you pick door number one and uh you can either stick with that door or listen to what monty hall the the the, the host has to say and what he does then is he's got doors two and three remaining and he shows you one of the doors he, let's say he just shows you door number three he opens door number three and behind door number three then is a goat so your option then is to stick with your door door number one or switch to door number two should you switch that's the question right should you actually switch from door number one to door number two now that you know there's a goat behind door number three is it 50 50 or is it something more to it so we talk about it in the podcast go to um wherever you find your podcast go to spotify or, or google google podcast or itunes and it's um, on use because as well use because.com forward slash podcasts um but it's an interesting it's an interesting scenario because your intuition is not necessarily going to be right in that particular scenario it isn't i'm going to give the game away here but it isn't 50 50. so in this book he talks about now not he doesn't talk specifically about the, the monty hall problem but he talks about um understanding numbers right he, he talks about how um numbers can be massaged and how numbers can um have gra like basically humans like to see things in in graph form because our brains are not set up to see like 100 numbers on an excel sheet show it to me graphically show it to me in a in a pie chart histogram whatever something that i can see that the numbers are going up right our sales are going up or whatever it is that you want it to be going up we can but the thing is that the person who has put this graph together they can make it look a certain way by doing certain things right another thing he talks about then is how to interpret uh uh words um so say for example he says something in the book something like um uh you know a, a third of the people in um in the world have access to to uh, clean toilets and he says it's very very important um to think about that word access or another one he says is you know two-thirds of americans have access to the best health care and he says well define the word access what does that actually mean does it mean that it's you know a mile down the road i can physically get there but I can't afford to go in there and I can't afford to pay for any of the procedures. What does access actually mean? So, and, and the third thing then he says, I'll just I'll tell you one more thing or, um, about this one. The third one is um, how to interpret the world. So, for example, if you want to see a website that is, um, you know, looks very professional, looks very uh, believable, how do you know you can believe it? So one of the things he says and that there's loads of examples in this book for, for how to go about um upping your game when it comes to not being naive or, or not just believing something as it looks believable one of the things he says is to check um backlinks right if you look at a website say for, i think the example i gave in the um in the podcast was amazon if you look at amazon um lots of other websites link to amazon so what google will do if it wants to rank amazon really high it look at amazon and see what other websites are linking back to Amazon? They're called backlinks. The, the more backlinks it has, the more trustworthy it is, it is because it's like the wisdom of crowds kind of thing that, well, all these other people are trusting it, so it's probably trustworthy. Now, obviously, Google does more than just look at the backlinks. But that's one of the things they do. So it's one of the things you can do. You can, if you're so inclined, you can go on to um, uh, the Google Search Console. So it's a thing you need to log into. I think you need a Google AdWords account for it. It's free and um you can mess around with it and kind of look at a website that you know you know claims to be medical expertise but is it like is it just some some bloke in his bedroom um who's just made his website that makes him look like a doctor but is he really that's one way of doing it another way is to look at accreditation um you know who says this person is an expert um have they got peer-reviewed articles in medical journals or whatever the thing is that you want to look at but ultimately, he says that in this book, uh, expertise is a judgment call uh, at the end of the day. That's why when they have, you know, 
uh, key witness testimony at, at trials and so on, you know, how believable is the wit is the expert? You know, um, who says he's an expert, right? Uh, is he accredited? Do is there is he considered an expert in the in the wider world? And the example he gives in this book is of Einstein, right? Sixty years ago, Einstein was top of the game when it came to physics. If you were to bring him back to life right now today, would he be an expert? No, because he'd be sixty years behind. Now, of course, he could learn all the stuff and everything that we've I say we survived on any of it. Everything that has happened in physics, a lot of it is built on his theories and his ideas and his thought experiments. But he's still 60 years behind. So could you consider him an expert in physics today? Or do you need to give him time to catch up? So expertise is um, it's subjective, ultimately. Um, but in this book, he gives you great insight into how, how to make sure that you're not being duped, basically. And, and again, just like this book, Sense Making, and there's so much coming at us all the time about different things. It's important to, um, when really important things come up, to kind of hit the pause button and say, right, well, is that really believable? Um, and then allow your human intuition in there as well. So two books on making sense of the world, on lies and statistics, and on interpreting data. Uh, I think they're both really brilliant books. I only really do podcasts and these mashups on 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 what I consider to be really excellent books. Um, both well worth a read. Uh, go to usebecause.com and have a look at our courses. We do courses based on some of these books as well. Um, we want to make sure that you're able to learn them uh, correctly. So we want to make sure, that, and to us learning is three pillars. It's making sure that you understand the content, you can remember it and go and deliberately practice it. They're the three things we want you to do. So go to usebecause.com, click all around the place there, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram or Facebook and uh, find me on LinkedIn as well. So that's it. Until next time, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Tell two people you know about usebecause.com. All right. Cheers.